My family all worked 9 to 5. They had mortgages and health plans and spent most evenings sprawled in front of their TVs because they were too tired to do anything else. I couldn't live like that. Even thinking about it made me feel as if I couldn't breathe. So as soon as I was old enough, I packed a change of clothes, a toothbrush, and a couple of paperback books in a backpack and I left home. I had some money in my wallet and the letter that my grandfather had given me in the top pocket to my checkered shirt. I didn't smoke, but he had told me the lighter had been his lucky charm, so I liked to keep it close. I did not need anything else. I hitched my first ride that morning in a truck heading north. It was a beautiful day, unseasonably warm for late October. The sky was clear and I had the wind on my face, until the truck driver told me to get my darn fool head back in the cab. I once saw a man get decapitated that way, he said. One minute he was spouting on about what a beautiful world we live in. The next moment his head was rolling down the highway, looking more like a squashed melon than a fresh-faced fellow. I waited for him to wink at me or crack a smile and say that he was only joking, but he kept on looking deadly serious, so I sat back in my seat and rolled the window up for good measure. Hours later, he pulled up outside a diner. Apart from a couple of other trucks, there was nothing else in sight. I clamored out thinking, this is perfect, and stood stretching and breathing in the air. The smell of diesel and stale fried food took the smile off my face. I sighed and went inside. The trucker who had brought me this far had told me that he was heading to a nearby docks to offload, and that was a dead end for me. So, before I went to the counter, I asked the other drivers in the diner if I could ride with them. The first one blanked me and continued to shove apple pie into his mouth. The other trucker grunted. I took that as a yes and went to get myself a coffee and a BLT, hoping that I would be on the move again soon. And 30 minutes or so later, I was back on the road. My new companion was a man of few words and most of these were directed colorfully at the other drivers in the road. Apparently no one knew how to drive but him. Thankfully, the highway began to clear and the cussing had died down, and the temperature seemed to be dipping as well, and I wished that I had brought a thicker jacket with me. The trucker appeared oblivious, but I was soon shivering, and to make matters worse, the sun was dipping down towards the horizon. It was going to be a cold night, I had seen a program on cable TV once about truckers. The ones in the show were all oversized characters in every way, who took whatever mishap came their way on the chin. I also remembered the voiceover going on about how the drivers needed to park up and rest every now and then. This was a legal requirement. We had been traveling for an age, but the, the trucker that I was riding with showed no sign of stopping. Maybe I thought he was waiting for a suitable place, somewhere with a restroom and a fresh supply of strong coffee and food dripping with grease. As I stared out the window, all I could see was the highway stretching out into the gloom. There were no buildings or other vehicles. I wrapped my arms around myself, tried to will some heat into my toes, and closed my eyes as the last of the light had disappeared. I woke with a sore neck and a dry mouth, blinking and coughing and wondering where on earth I was. I looked around. It was light again outside, but the windscreen was coated with condensation. I wiped a patch clear with my sleeve and saw that we were parked up by a burger place. The driver was walking towards the truck, carrying two bucket-sized cups of coffee and burger boxes. He handed me mine along with my wallet which he must have taken while I was sleeping. It looked like I had paid. I wasn't happy about having my pockets picked, but I was famished, so I decided not to make a scene. After bolting down my breakfast, I just had chance to run out and relieve myself before we were back on the road. Twelve long hours later, we pulled up at an intersection. There was a gas station, a motel, and a store with an attached diner sticking on one side like an extended finger gathered around it. End of the road, the driver muttered, 
first thing that he had said all day. I grunted my thanks and clambered out. I hadn't noticed it when we were pulling up, but as I stood there wondering what to do next, I noticed a sign by the side of the road saying, Keep Alaska tidy. And my imagination stirred. I was looking to escape the humdrum routine of life, and here I was in a land of wilderness and adventure, according to the TV shows that I had watched. Well, it was time to see how reality had measured up, after I had slept in a bed and showered. I went into the motel and paid in cash for a room for one night. I fell asleep the moment that my head hit the pillow, and when I woke up after an unbroken sleep, I felt refreshed and ready for a new day. And then I began to itch. In the middle of my back first, and then on my leg, and then my stomach. I scratched where I could, but I would have had to have an octopus to reach all the places that were now itching at once. I threw back the bed covers and I grimaced. My body, where I could see it, was covered in red, swollen bite marks. Bed bugs, I thought, and I leapt out of the bed. Showering helped soothe things a bit, for as long as the water was hitting me, and then the discomfort flared back up worse than ever. I couldn't even bear to look at the state of my face in the mirror, and after dressing quickly and grabbing my backpack, I hurried out of the motel. I bought a tube of bite cream in the store and then went to a restroom, locked myself into a cubicle, and coated myself with it. I wasn't as itchy after this, but I must have looked even weirder. I'm wondering if anybody would give me a lift now, I headed for the diner attached to the store. The waitress did not bat a drawn on eyelid at me when I walked in. There were only two other customers, a couple married from the rings on their fingers. The husband was a stick thin, but his plate was piled high with pancakes, bacon, eggs, and grits. His wife, who was slim rather than skinny, just had scrambled eggs on brown toast in front of her. I got up my courage and I wandered over to their table. Hey, I said, I'm looking for a ride. I would like to get out of here before the bugs eat any more of me. The woman looked at my face and exclaimed, Ouch. Her husband smiled sympathetically and said, We're heading off after we've eaten to a town way north of here. It's a place we discovered online and we're going to try our luck there. You're welcome to ride with us. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I said and held out my hand to shake. He pulled a face and I was momentarily offended until I remembered my hand was slathered in still sticky cream. And just give me a nod when you're ready to set off. I said into the uncomfortable silence and then moved to an empty table. I ordered pancakes and juice for myself. The waitress brought extra napkins with my order and told me they were for me to wipe the cutlery with when I was finished. I was relieved when the couple told me that they were set to leave, and I followed them out to a rundown looking camper van. The couple who introduced themselves once we had set off as Matt and Jude were my friendliest at traveling companions yet. They told me how they had been made redundant and decided to sell up and make a fresh start. They wanted to start a family as well and to run their own business. They were bubbling with ideas and enthusiasm and I felt like I was with kindred spirits. Though when they asked me what my ambitions were, I felt like a loser when I told them that I didn't have any specific plans. The conversation faltered a bit after that, and I returned to looking out of the window. When they took turns driving, Matt used his brakes to eat cold cuts of meat, slice after slice of cheese and pickles, and when he was back behind the wheel, he snacked constantly on chips and cookies. I had no idea where he was putting it all. The rest of the day passed in this way. It was well after dark and I could see nothing outside by the time that we had pulled up. Jude made her way into the back of the van and started to make up a double bed. I was wondering where I could sleep when Matt turned to me and said, The town's five miles north of here. Shouldn't take you long to walk. I started to ask him if he was joking but I saw from his expression that he was serious. That's another welcome worn out, I thought, and opened the door. It was a cold, clear night, and the stars were out. There were no signs, just the road disappearing into the distance. Trees rose on either side of the highway, 
and I could hear rustling sounds in the distance. Must be the local wildlife, I figured. But I had no idea what was scurrying around out there in the darkness as I trudged away from the van. I kept to the gravel at the side of the road to avoid any traffic. But as the hours passed, the road narrowed, and the trees pressed in closer to the edges of the tarmac. I had no choice but to walk pretty much in the middle of the road. I could only see a few feet in front of me, so I focused on listening for approaching traffic. I was increasingly jittery, I was going to end up as roadkill, and then be a tasty midnight stack for a scavenger. Turning back was not an option that lessened the odds of me being wiped out, so I had no choice but to continue. I don't think that I had ever been so miserable in my life, and I was on the verge of tears when finally, I saw a light in the distance, and my heart soared. The light was faint and still some way off, and I had no idea where it was coming from, but that did not matter. Light meant people, and fingers crossed, a hot drink and a meal. I increased my pace. The trees around me were starting to thin out and I could make out the shape of a building. The light was coming from one of its windows. I stood alone in its own grounds and I thought I could see more buildings in the distance, but they were all in darkness. I had lost track of time, but as it was still pitch black, I guessed that the light marked the home of an early riser or an insomniac. As I came closer, I could make out ornate lettering in the window of the building and I hesitated. It was a mortician's. Well, I thought grimly. I was feeling deadbeat, so this place would have to do. I strode up to the door and I knocked. A shadowy shape inside approached and the door swung slowly open. A gray-haired man wearing a collarless shirt, braces, and dark trousers appeared. He smiled at me and said, My condolences for your loss. Oh, no, I replied, realizing that he must think that I was here because someone had died. I don't want you to bury anyone, I'm just arrived in town, you see, and well, I was hoping for a coffee and maybe a bite to eat. He frowned. This is not a cafe, young man, he said. Before he closed the door in my face, I said the first thing that came to mind. I would work to pay you for it. His frown eased and I could tell that he was thinking. Well, he said, my gravedigger is laid up in bed with two broken legs and I have a funeral today, so I could offer you work in return for food and drink. If you are capable of digging a grave, then we have a deal. He held out a hand and we shook. A couple of hours later, I was standing in a graveyard with a shovel in my hand, trying to remember the precise instructions that I had been given. The plot had already been laid out, and the mortician had stressed how important it was that the dimensions were exact, that the sides of the excavation be straight, and that the surrounding area be left neat. I mean, how hard could it be, I thought, and I plunged the shovel in. Although the sun was faint, soon sweat was trickling down my neck. My arms were aching and there was a sharp pain in my lower back every time that I straightened up. I was so not used to physical labor. It was around noon before I had finished and I had not seen a single person while I was working. The graveyard was within easy walking distance of the mortician's premises, which was on the outskirts of the town and surrounded by dirt and weeds with only a couple of sorry looking trees between it and its nearest neighbor, a derelict hotel. I had not had a chance to explore the town before I had started work but from the bits that I had seen, it looked to be a pretty old-fashioned place. The buildings were constructed of wood and flagpoles were popular, as were rusty trucks and mangy-looking dogs. One of these hounds was staring at me, as I stood and grimaced at the pain that I was feeling, and parts of my body that I had never thought about before. I was sore but also in high spirits, now that the grave was dug, and I called out to the dog, Howdy, neighbor. Maybe you can show me where I can get a cold beer later. And then I found a spot under a tree and took the opportunity to have a rest. My labors were not over yet. After the funeral, I had to fill the grave back in. And after that, I would have a drink and something to eat and then find a bed for the night. This was the life, I thought. 
and dozed as somewhere nearby a bell began to ring. I had not yet seen the local chapel but assumed it was conveniently close to its flock's final resting place. And sure enough, not long after the bells had started tolling, I saw a small procession heading my way. A minister was leading the way, with a coffin and a horse driven by the mortician, followed by half a dozen mourners. I got to my feet and dusted myself off. I hadn't been told what I was meant to do during the committal, so I backed off a bit and stood there with my head bowed and my hands in front of me. I had no idea who was being buried, but showing respect seemed like a decent thing to do. Once the service was complete and the mourners and the minister had started to leave, I headed over to the mortician to ask him if it was okay for me to start filling the grave in. When he saw me approaching, the mortician smiled and said to me, Excellent work today, thank you. When you're finished up here, do you want to come back to the funeral parlor? I would like to discuss you staying on for a few days, if that's of interest. I nodded enthusiastically. I thought that it would be fun to spend a little while in this town before heading on to pastures new. I started to shovel earth onto the coffin and, once I was alone again, began to whistle as I worked. A short while later, I was knocking on the door of the mortician for the second time that day. He was wiping his hands on a towel. Come in, he said. I was just cleaning up and getting ready for my next customer, whoever they might be. I was starting to like this man. He clearly put a lot of care into his work, but he also had a somewhat wicked sense of humor. I followed him inside through a small reception area into an office and then into a back room. It was empty apart from a long table and a tall cupboard. The mortician turned to me and said, I can't afford to pay you much, I'm afraid, but I can offer you room and board. I would have spent my wage on a place to sleep and my meals anyway, so I figured this was ideal. Yeah, that's great, I replied. Uh, where will I sleep? In here, he told me. I live on the other side of town, so you have the place to yourself when I'm not working. Even better, I thought, my own space. I just had one question. Um, what is this room normally used for? I asked. Without skipping a beat, he replied. It's where I prepare the bodies before they're taken to the chapel of rest. Oh, I thought, seeing the room and the table in a whole new light. The mortician headed off after this, returning an hour or so later with blankets and a pillow, and a stack of tuna sandwiches and a flask of coffee. He left me to sort myself out and said that he would see me later and then added, One word of warning, the cupboard contains materials that I use in the embalming process. Some are toxic and highly flammable, so don't be tempted to go around rummaging in there. And with that, he gave me a cheery wave and left. I laid out the blankets and pillow on the floor and tried to get comfortable. I did not think that I would be able to sleep because I was feeling a bit creeped out. But all that fresh air and exercise, it turned out to be a great sedative. I was woken by the sound of a car door slamming and I rubbed my eyes blurrily. I could see out of the window that it was dark outside. And then I heard a voice that I recognized. Just through here, the mortician said. The door to my sleeping quarters swung open and the light was turned on. I sat up and watched as the mortician led in two men wearing police uniforms. They were carrying something bulky wrapped in a blanket, which they put on one of the tables. Thank you, the mortician said. The officers tipped their caps and filed out. I dragged myself to my feet. I couldn't take my eyes off the thing in the blanket, and I was starting to feel pretty green because I knew what it was. I had a new roommate, a corpse. The mortician seemed oblivious to my distress and told me in a matter-of-fact voice, this poor fellow was a newly arrived in town. I'm just going to go next door and start on the paperwork. And with that, he left me alone with the corpse. Now, I'd seen dead bodies before, but always on TV. And they were always a make-believe. And as grossed out as I was, something was drawing me to take a peek at this actual stiff. I knew that it was wrong, but I moved over to the table and, with a shaky hand, moved a corner of the blanket away. 
and I recoiled in horror at the pale skin of the face revealed. The blood gathered in dark pools beneath the skin, at the eyes which were glimpses of darkness between partially closed lids, at the foul smell that assaulted my senses and made me begin to gag, and because I recognized the body. The last time that I had seen him, Matt had been telling me that it was a five mile walk to town, and now he was reduced to this, a cold shell. I put my hand over my mouth, trying to breathe as steady and to not vomit, and bitterly regretting my decision to go see what a dead body actually looked like. I backed away as far as I could go, which was only a few feet in this room, which suddenly felt far too small and airless. I needed to get out, but before I could, Matt's mouth moved, or rather something moved inside his mouth. I froze, unable to do anything but stare as his cheeks bulged and rippled. Whatever was in there was big and it was getting busy. And then his lips parted and they were forced to part and a hideous creature appeared. It was slender, snake-like and paler than even Matt's dead skin. It rose from between his open lips, up into the air over his face, where it hovered and dipped, blindly it seemed. I wanted to scream but I could barely breathe. I clenched my fists in to find my voice. Help! I called out, weakly at first and then louder and louder. Help! Help! I was still hollering when the door swung open and the mortician rushed into the room. What's wrong? he asked, and then stopped in his tracks. He had seen the creature that had risen out of the corpse's mouth, only he did not look horrified. He walked up to it and grasped it with one hand and then began to pull. Like a disgusting magical trick, feet after feet of the thing emerged and finally, when a tip appeared and there was no more, the mortician turned to me. The thing dangled from his hand and trailed across the floor. It's a tapeworm, he said. They can spend years, decades even, inside a person's body, feeding on the nutrients in their host's meals and affecting that person's eating habits and weight. But when their hosts die, they will starve, and some try and leave. He held the thing, the tapeworm, higher and added, like this fellow, and then he took it outside. I did not ask the mortician how or where he had disposed of it. In fact, we never spoke of the incident again. Three days later, Matt was buried in the town's graveyard. I took care of the digging and the filling, of course. His widow Jude did not attend, and I later learned that she had driven out of town in the camper van as soon as she could. I was still feeling pretty shaken up and decided that I too would move on. The regular grave digger continued to be laid up with his broken legs, and though there were no funerals scheduled, I didn't want to leave the mortician in a lurch, so I went to tell him that I was leaving, but would not go until he had another grave digger lined up. He had been good to me and this seemed like the decent thing to do. I found him in his office. Winter had crept up on us and I could hear the wind outside. The mortician finished a phone call and looked up at me. I have a job for you, he said. That's not the usual grave digging. I was intrigued and forgot about giving notice. Sure, I said. I'm happy to help. That is much appreciated, he told me. A couple of gold prospectors have radioed the police after finding a dead man in a cabin in the woods. The prospectors had called in to see if they could buy supplies off him, but I found him expired. I knew the man. He was 90 and had a number of health issues, but there were no red flags, and no point in the police or the doctor trailing out there. I said we would go collect the body. When you say we, I'm guessing you mean me, I asked. He answered me with another question. If you are amiable. I am, I answered. At the end of the day, it would be a new adventure. The mortician showed me where the cabin was on a map. It was in the middle of a forest. You won't get lost, the mortician said, possibly having sensed the unease that I was feeling as I looked at the map. There's only one road, just keep to that and you can't go wrong. And then he handed me over the keys to the hearse, a fresh flask of coffee and a stack of sandwiches, and said that he would be seeing me later. And telling myself that everything would be okay, I stepped outside and with perfect timing, saw what I took to be a positive sign. 
A lone snowflake was a drifting down right in front of me. What a beautiful world we live in, I thought. And then I climbed into the hearse and started the engine. The journey began well enough. The hearse had a heater and with it I turned it all the way up to full and I felt nice and warm. There was no coffin in the back and all I had to do was carry the body from the cab into the hearse. And once I was back in town the experts would take over. I whistled as the forest grew denser around me and the hearse rattled along over the road, which wasn't much of a road. It soon narrowed into a track and I felt like I was aiming the hearse at a gap in between the trees, rather than following a route laid out on the ground. It was disconcerting, and telling myself that this was what adventures were all about did not help. I was hungry and thirsty as well by now, having stress eaten the sandwiches and gulped on the coffee, and I had no idea what time it was. The reception bars on my mobile were permanently flattened out of sight, and I'd let the battery run down so it was no use, and I could not make out where the sun was through the canopy of the trees to even estimate how much of the day had passed. Thankfully, my destination came into sight. It was a ramshackle old thing. Its tin roof sloped onto one side, where the remains of a chimney poked up looking like a broken tooth. The timbers of the walls were dark with moss and there was a note pinned to the outside of the door. I parked up, liberated the note and read, To whom it may concern, we took oats and coffee and gasoline and have left money. We know cash is no use to the man inside, but if whoever takes care of his remains could pass it on to his relatives, that would be much appreciated. There were a couple of signatures scribbled at the bottom. I let the note fall to the ground and went inside. The dead man was slumped in a chair by a table, with a bottle of whiskey and a tumbler in front of him. Both were empty, so I figured he had not left his immortal coil sober. Which was not a bad way to go, I figured, and I put my arms under his armpits and lifted him. He was quite awake, but digging graves had done my strength a world of good so I was able to drag him out to the hearse without too much panting and cussing on my part. And then I left him propped up against one of the back wheels. Before I put him in the hearse, I decided to go see if I could find food and a drink back inside the cabin, and I was also going to get the money. I thought of nothing else. It could go towards the mortician's cause. I left him the dead man there for about 15 and 20 minutes max, and when I returned, no harm had been done. There were a few flies investigating his face, but I brushed these away and manhandled him into the back of the hearse. It felt to have grown noticeably colder while I was inside, and more snow was beginning to fall. Not just single flakes, but flurries, which danced in a swirling wind. I closed the back of the hearse and walked towards the driver's door. A distance of a few steps, but I paused halfway through, because I thought that I had seen something moving among the trees. Some kind of animal. Something big and fast and now nowhere to be seen. A ripple of unease passed through me and I hurried into the hearse, slammed the door and was glad when the engine had started first time. My wheels threw up dirt from the track and the hearse rocked as it set off. I drove faster than I had on the way there. My passenger was in no particular hurry, but I was keen to be back at the mortician's. The branches of trees scraped against these sides of the hearse as my flustered state meant that my steering wasn't great, but it was fine and I was fine, until I saw the sleek shape cutting through the forest to my left. Even partially obscured by the trees, I could make out that it was easily six feet long and was moving in rapid strides on all fours. Its pale pelt was marked by dark patches. Thoughts of a dead man's skin flashed through my mind. I sped up. I didn't know what this creature was or why it was following me, and I didn't want to know. All I cared about was leaving it behind. But the creature was still there, and it was no longer alone. There was another one on my right, and one behind me I saw when I glanced in the mirror. My hands tightened on the steering wheel, and I threw all caution to the wind. I floored the accelerator. At last, the trees began to clear and I could no longer see the creatures. 
I was out of the forest and I had outrun them. Man and machine once more coming out ahead of the beast. And even better, the mortician's building was ahead. I slowed down. The snow had continued to fall and now I was out in the open. I could see that it was coming down heavier and heavier. So much so that in a few minutes it took me to reach a parking spot by the mortician's door. The ground was covered. I had to fight to open the hearse door as the wind was upping the ante as well. The snow was being driven against me as I stepped out and I could not see more than a few feet in any direction. I hurried inside. There was no sign of the mortician but there was a note in the reception. It said, Looks like the first big storm of winter is coming, so I'm going to hole up at home till it passes. Please just put the body on the preparation table and then batten down the hatches. I'll see you when the weather clears. Oh, great, just great. I thought I went back out into the blizzard to get the dead man. It was going dark by now and the wind howling out there in the night it made me think of the creatures that had followed me through the forest. Until I had left them on my wake. I told myself to relax. There was no sign of anyone or anything. Not even the town's dogs were out tonight. I opened up the hearse and lifted out the body. Once I had the corpse inside and maneuvered it onto the table, I sat down on the floor exhausted and more determined than ever to give my notice. I would do that in the morning, I decided, and I felt myself starting to doze off. The sound of scratching made me sit up straight. It was coming from the other side of the door. I could feel my heart beating faster and faster as I got to my feet and went over to a window where I swore quietly to myself, exhaling a profanity. The creatures from the forest were outside, and they were pacing up and down, their pale pelts making them look like ghosts in the darkness. Only these were no unsubstantial spirits. I could see their jagged fangs, the sharp tips of their claws, as they moved across the snow-covered earth. One of them rushed suddenly at the door, and I heard but could not see the collision as its body slammed into the wood. And then the scratching began again. It was trying to find a way in, and I was trapped and helpless. Yelling out for help would make no difference. My voice would have been drowned out by the wind, but I could call for help another way. I ran into the office and lifted the telephone to my ear. Cursed, I slammed it back down. The line was dead. It must have been from the storm. So I was alone. The sound of a new collision of a powerful body flinging itself against timber filled the air. I looked out of the office window but could see nothing now other than snow. I ran through to where the body was laid out on the table and I tried that window. One of the creatures stared back at me. Its mouth was drawn into a snarl and its eyes were black, darker than any night. I found myself transfixed by its hideous gaze and simply stood and watched as the creature reared up. Its paws and snout pressed against the window as its breath misted the glass. But it was not looking at me. It was looking past me at the corpse. My mind scrambled to understand. Was it me the creature sought? My warm flesh, my blood, which was pulsing faster and faster through my veins? Or did they hunger after another prey? One whose meat was cold, whose blood had congealed? My thoughts were torn back to the cabin, to how I had left the dead body propped up outside while I went back inside. The corpse's scent would have been rich, irresistible, and it would have drawn them to it. And once they had that scent, they would not have wanted to let it go, until they had ripped dead flesh from bone and devoured the man whose body lay a few feet away from me. This was grotesque, twisted, terrifying. The creature fell back down into all fours and padded away, and for a moment there was only silence, save for the blood pounding in my eyes, and then the sickening sound of sleek, strong bodies slamming themselves against the door came again. I heard wood breaking. I had minutes before they broke the door and they were inside, and I had to think, and a desperate idea occurred to me. I opened the cupboard where the materials for embalming were stored. The largest bottle inside was formaldehyde according to the label, a skull and crossbones next to the letter indicating that it was toxic. 
but it was the illustration of a flame that told me what I wanted to know. This liquid was flammable. I carried the bottle through to the office, and I had just reached it when the door finally gave. The creatures raced through the ragged opening past the reception and past me, into the room where the body waited. I had been right. I was not the feast they wanted. Not yet, anyway. I could hear them snarling, in a frenzy now that they had made it to the corpse. But I did not look into the room. I did not want to see the repulsive act that was being committed. I reached into the pocket of my shirt and took out the lighter my grandfather had given me, his lucky charm. I opened the lid and clicked the wheel. A spark flickered and a flame sprang into life. I took a piece of paper from the mortician's desk, lit it, and then dropped it onto the floor, at the end of the trail of formaldehyde that I had poured. The liquid flared and a line of fire began to race towards the creatures. I kicked the door to the room that they were enclosed and I dragged the desk table over as a barricade. I had doused the floor around the preparation table holding the corpse, hoping a fire would consume everything, and I could already hear the desperate roars of the creatures. They were trapped in the flames. Where I stood, smoke was filling the air and the fire was spreading, across the floor and up the walls. I had to get out of there. Coughing and shielding my face with my arms, I ran outside. The snow had stopped and the night was clear and still, apart from the inferno which I had left behind. I fell to my knees and wept with relief as the fire raged. There were no monsters left, no creatures to fear. I was safe.